joining uh, my presentation about how to perform Zephyr uh, over the air update um, using uh, LoRa 1. Uh, presentation was made by me. Uh, my name is Piotr Krul and my fellow colleague uh, from LPM plant, Paweł Czaplewski. So uh, who am I? I'm Piotr Krul. I'm CEO and co-founder of LPM plant. Uh, I'm managing embedded firmware projects since 2015. Uh, I'm Zephyr enthusiast since the beginning, since the announcement uh, uh, of Zephyr at Embedded Linux Conference uh, Europe, uh, and then started to uh, play with it in January 2017. And I'm conference speaker and, and organizer. I'm an evangelist of open source firmware. You, you may know me from the uh, core boot community or from open, open source uh, firmware communities uh, across the uh, ecosystem. I'm 13 years in, in business, and you may also know me as a C-level um, person in, in various other organizations. Uh, who, who is LPN, LPN plant and what we do? We're doing wireless connectivity um, integration uh, in industrial applications. So we can say industry for, for zero or industrial IoT. Uh, we integrated applications related to smart metering, smart lightning, um, those applications typically are built on top of open source software components. Um, we are embedded software developers leveraging Zeph Zephyr on nodes and on the gateway side, we typically use Yocto. Uh, sometimes we're using Zen, we're using advanced security features like Trenchboot. And of course, we're trying to, to put as much open source firmware uh, in those components as possible. Uh, what I will uh, talk about today I will start with some short introduction to LoRa 1. I believe most of you know this uh, this um, technology, uh, but uh, for those who don't know, I just want to give some short intro. Then um, I will talk a little bit about possibilities of uh, updating Zephyr-based applications, uh, which are related mostly with uh, mostly to MCU boot. Then I will say like, what's the problem of uh, updating? Um, updating um, over LoRa 1 and what's, what are the limitations and what kind of constraints we have here. And then I will describe solution uh, from the gateway perspective, from the node perspective, how we leverage uh, LoRa 1 multicast, and then what's the update logic we have uh, in our solution. And then finally, we will have some demo. Uh, you can call it demo, but this is, will be more like a console screens, and uh, I have some, some video, uh, but it's very um, log uh, intensive, and I don't know if this will be a super pleasant experience. Um, so let's start with um, LoRa 1. So LoRa 1 is a long range wide area network uh, networking standard, uh, which leverages leverage unlicensed uh, radio spectrum, uh, relate, uh, which is used for industrial, scientific, and medical purposes. Um, so um, this uh, this network is used uh, well in in urban areas. It has good even indoor um, um, ranges. And as you can see on the right on on the picture, uh, this is picture from Semtech. Uh, they they are leader of of this technology. Uh, you may have um, uh, various sensors like in home, in industry, uh, some even um, related to the location, uh, some to agriculture. And those sensors um, can communicate with, with gateways. And typically, those gateways trans transfer this um, LoRa uh, network uh, communication to some Wi-Fi, Ethernet, or cellular communication, and then can reach some cloud to, re to report that data. Uh, there is uh, there is end-to-end -end encryption for this data. Uh, LoRa 1 use uh, AS128. Um, it is good alternative to narrowband IoT and LTEM uh, because those new technologies are introduced very small, very slowly, uh, and uh, for some applications we cannot use public carrier. We want to have our on-premise um, technology and our on-premise network in which we transfer data from the smart uh, sensors or in, in which we um, um, control our smart lighting systems. It is low power, so it can easily uh, create uh, battery-based applications or can leverage um, energy harvesting. And uh, yeah, and as I said, we can both leverage public gateways uh, for communication, or we can create our own and have our private network. 
In case of uh, device firmware upgrade um, in Zephyr, um, Zephyr-based uh, applications can be updated using um, a, a device firmware upgrade subsystem, which is already integrated in Zephyr. Uh, this, sub, this subsystem contains interface to bootloader and some firmware image management uh, functions. Uh, the mm -hmm. proposed bootloader and already integrated bootloader is MCU boot. It is Apache 2.0 licensed uh, bootloader. It's, it can be integrated with various art, uh, artoses, and so because of that, it's very flexible. And uh, yeah. there are right now only uh, two um, trans transport protocols supported in Zephyr. There is Bluetooth and Serial, and we kind of added the LoRaWAN. This is not yet uh, uh, contributed, uh, but uh, but we're thinking about contributing this uh, this technology if, of course, co community will be interested. Um, so um, so we we enable um, we, you can enable MCU boot quite easily. There is a uh, quite good documentation about about that uh, under the link on the bottom of this slide. So what kind of strategies you can uh, use for updating your uh, Zephyr-based application? So first strategy is related to fixed location firmware. So we have two two main. Uh, possibility of having firmware. I, either we have fixed location, so we start from given address, or we have execute in place, which means like we can start from any address in SPI flash, uh, for example. And uh, in case of fixed location, there are um, there are two um, main uh, ways. There is swapping way and overwriting way, which I will describe on the on the further slides. But on this slide, you can also see the partitioning of our SPI flash. So at the beginning, we have MCU boot, uh, our bootloader. Then we have uh, Zephyr-based application um, in primary slot. Secondary slot is used for, for the updates. There is scratch pipe uh, part, uh, area, which is used for swapping. I will explain that in a second. And there is some persistent storage area where we, for example, can keep LoRaWAN uh, keys, uh, encryption keys, or we can uh, keep some persistent configuration data for the application. So after update, we still uh, using something which is which is some persistent. We we not over override configuration data, which is still in persist persistent uh, partition. In case of swapping, um, a swapping method, um, swapping strategy um, use scratch area to swap content between primary and secondary slot. So um, Let's say we finish it, our transfer of the of the update image to the to, to our microcontroller, uh, and we store it already this image into secondary slot. Uh, what happens at this point when we want to use swapping strategy is uh, that we reboot to MCU boot, and MCU boot uh, copies fragments of uh, our uh, primary slot, our our firmware that that we our old firmware we can say to scratch uh, scratch battery and then uh, erase this uh, this block and then copy the new uh, firmware update into primary slot and it it continues that until it, it finish then it verifies that everything in primary slot is okay and booting that firmware so that's one of the strategy so we can say in this strategy we always using primary slot second strategy strategy is uh, just overwrite uh, the primary slot. The problem with that strategy is, of course, that if if the, if our updated uh, image is broken, um, then of course we we end up with with uh, not upgradable environment. We we break it our our device. Of course, this may be mitigated by uh, previous testing and so on. But this is this is definitely a more flawed strategy than the than the swapping one. Of course, swapping one is is more complicated. Requires more more coding and more um, uh, attention to to details. Uh, other strategies that you may use is uh, uh, direct execute in place. Uh, this strategy use uh, flag that show active image, and we just point to active image. Uh, either it is in first slot, either it is in second second slot. And this toggling between the image is maintained by the MCU boot. And then other strategy can be RAM load. So in that strategy, we just have um, we just decide from what location we load 
uh, of course, we're not running from flash in this situation. We're running from memory. So first of all, we're loading into memory and then execute. And this decision about from what location we load is, is maintained by the bootloader. And yeah, so in case of uh, thermo in case of details about various other designs and how to implement that and how MCU boot handles that, you can read the documentation. And I believe there is other lecture about uh, MCU boot, which probably will describe that in details. In case of terminology here, I, I'm kind of switching. Uh, Zephyr use the, the device firmware upgrade. LoRa in LoRa we typically talking about over the air uh, updates or upgrades. So I will use those terms uh, interchangeably in this in this uh, presentation. What kind of problems we have with um, with updates uh, in, in LoRa? First of all, of course, maybe this is like generic problem of any embedded application. Uh, we don't want to have any any or like we want to minimize downtime of the of the node and downtime where we don't get information or we cannot control uh, our microcontroller our application in microcontroller. Uh, second thing is LoRa one payload size are are very small, and in comparison to the firmware size, so um, typically up updates take very long, and of of course have to be designed to handle. A situation in which, for example, we lose um, some packets uh, because of the uh, noisy environment uh, or crowded environment in, in which we operate. Then, other problem is uh, or problem um, we have to comply to the regulation. Um, and in Europe, uh, duty cycle for LoRa one, depending on the channel, is either 0.1 percent or 1 percent. So by duty cycle, I mean uh, um, the fraction. Uh, of one period in which the antenna of the uh, of our radio is enabled for sending and receiving, and um, so this means that um, we we have to we have to disable we have to have antenna mostly disabled. Of course, this is good for uh, battery life, uh, but also this means that there is need for certain management of the received package pa uh, packets during the updates. There are some features of LoRaWAN that can help optimi optimize. Uh, data rates that we have, which one of these features is the adaptive data rate, um, but there is the limitation um, depending on the. Um, it has its own limitation depending on the transmission. Uh, if we look at the at the channels and uh, and ability of of transferring uh, data, uh, the most uh, noise resilient channel is uh, is F is SF12, uh, uh, which we call data rate zero. Uh, but the payload size in this situation is just 51 bytes, uh, so you can see this is very uh, very small payload. So what kind of uh, solution we used? Uh, typically, we did on-premise application. Uh, that means like we had a gateway delivered to to the customer. Uh, our gateway is based on AMD quad-core uh, technology, four gig uh, four gig RAM, um, like kind of. A couple interfaces like USB, RS-232. Uh, there is Ethernet, so we can um, transfer this data also to some uh, some servers or even to cloud if needed. Uh, it is very extensible beca because it has additional MPCI slots, um, so we can, for example, add LTE. Uh, we can uh, add additional storage or some additional devices that uh, te technologies, so we can uh, do cross technology uh, gateway. In this situation, it is based on open source firmware. Uh, so we're using the Shadow Secure Gateway firmware, which is core boot based, uh, uh, famous replacement for regular BIOS. It uses uh, TPM, so security module. So we can, uh, for example, provide encrypted uh, file system. Uh, we can also um, keep some keys for uh, VPNs inside TPM and many other features that uh, security features that TPM provide. As I said, because of this MPCI slot, it is LTE and Wi-Fi ready. And for the outdoor version, we have IP67 uh, uh, certified uh, package. How the stack look like inside? I, as I said, on the bottom we have uh, our boot firmware. Then we using um, uh, Yocto BSP to create a kind of system which uh, has uh, a board, su board support package co containing uh, Linux kernel with, with required patches. U-boot and all other necessary stuff like uh, user space uh, libraries. 
And then we use uh, GFStack, uh, which has a couple, uh, couple dependencies related, mm, like MQTT broker. Uh, we added uh, Semtech packet forwarder, which with some small modifications, uh, which were required to uh, handle correctly communication, uh, update communication, but also application logic. And inside, in, inside the main, um, main system that operates uh, communication is ChirpStack. Um, it is a well-known project uh, related to uh, maintaining the, uh, the built self self hosted uh, system that can maintain LoRa nodes. Uh, this this chip stack contain uh, contains uh, of uh, gateway bridge, network server, and application server. And then this application server uh, has some integrations like HTTP, HTTP integrations, um, which we use to um uh to use which we use to um do the update we there are some uh, http calls that we uh, use from the external daemon um to talk uh, to talk with about uh, please send this packet or please give us information about the nodes which were not updated what kind of packets were not updated and i will talk about that uh, in in couple minutes uh, on the next slides uh, for node we are using STM32 L4 plus LoRa1 modules. Uh, for LoRa1 modules, we used various uh, various components, um, even even some cheap RFM95, uh, but also some certified one like uh, M dot um, um, uh, or recently uh, recently some other one like Rakwireless uh, stuff. Uh, of course, it it has MCU boot and Zephyr Artos. Uh, we have uh, onboard temperature measurement. We have uh, also humidity to just check if there is no um, additional like uh, problems with with uh, package. Uh, we have energy consumption monit monitoring. We have uh, digital inputs and outputs. We have uh, 20, 12 to 24 uh, DC um, input. Uh, like oh, we have, we need uh, this for power, or we can use battery. And plus, uh, we can support uh, RS-485, so all the mod buses, uh, 420 current loop and one wire. Um, and in, in various situations, we can even power on the sensors connected. In terms of software stack, uh, we have MCU boot on the, on the bottom. We have Zephyr. We use Watchdog, RTC, uh, digital analog converter. Of course, some sensor drivers, which we develop depending on the application. We have whole. LoRa stack, and then we have our own uh, update logic, uh, which leverage MCU boot um, and, and our application logic. OK, um, so typically we have we have one gateway uh, kind of star topology uh, in which we do we using multicast uh, to deliver uh, to, to deliver uh, packages. Of course, this is public bandwidth, so we to 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 not uh, flood everyone and to tell uh, that this package is just for given device uh, there is some special um, um, package formatting required so normally we just can do unicast so we can just send to one device but um, but in terms of in, in this situation we want to create uh, um, so-called multicast groups and uh, to uh, to build those multicast groups, we have to give every node a device ID, which is uh, unique in in our network. And uh, yeah, this is this is needed for receiving this multicast messages. So so devices know uh, that this is for me, and this is I'm in this group, and I want I want these messages. Um, and of course. Uh, to create those multicast groups, we need special keys because of the encryption in LoRa1. Uh, so there is multicast related uh, LoRa1 keys, uh, which we have to provision uh, for the devices. So using these multicast uh, groups, uh, we can create multicast mask, which say, OK, these devices should be addressed um, in this operation. Um, and using these device IDs, we, we solve two problems. We can deliver messages to multiple nodes or multiple subgroups of, of nodes, and we can uh, retransmit missing packages to specific nodes or specific group of nodes. Uh, when we start uh, update process, uh, we started with uh, 
some, we can say, preamble or some um, initial frame, which say uh, what, what device mask uh, uh, this, uh, for what group uh, this, uh, this set of packages that we will transmer, transmit after will be. Uh, we uh, also provide the CRC32 of the whole image that will be transferred, and we, we tell uh, to the nodes how many packets we will transfer. And then uh, every single package that we will transfer further uh, contain um, two, two bytes packet number, 48, by, 48 bytes uh, content of the packet, and one byte CRC8. So the process uh, looks as follows. We send an image and the gateway logic that you saw on the software stack slide uh, do the following things. First of all, uh, it calculates number. So let's say we provided some update to the gateway. We're telling gateway, please start sending this update to the nodes. So first, it uh, calculates number of packets. Then it pre prepares buffer, uh, we, of course, modulo 40, 48 bytes, because that's the effective payload we can use. And then we, we, we fill in this, uh, this buffer. Um, of course, we have to create some metadata and, and inform all the nodes about this metadata as a first step. And this is done um, in, in, this, uh, in this create update metadata block. Um, we're using a chirp stack API to send, send the packet. Then we waiting some uh, some delay to make sure that all the nodes will enter the state of receiving um, update, and we starting to create uh, small fragments from this buffer um, and start to send this uh, these fragments. It may happen that because of the noise, some of the packets will not be captured or some will be lost, and in that situation, uh, we will get at some point we will get information from nodes that some fragments were missing. And they will tell, OK, precisely which number uh, which number is missing. Then, of course, we um, process that information and uh, do the recent of the missing fragments. Inter uh, from, the, from the node side, it, it looks as follows. First of all, we receiving metadata packet, which saying um, there will be update uh, coming. Uh, so that's typically happen when we are in idle state from the, uh, from the update logic perspective. Uh, but when we get this information, we prepare the slot, the secondary slot to receive the fragments. We're starting to receive fragments and, and of course, saving those fragments in the spy flash. So that means that we're using um, our storage API for that. And this happened, this receiving and saving happen um, until, um, until, until we realize uh, some packets are, are lost. Um, if, if, that, if some packets are lost, then uh, we requesting from the gateway retras retransmission of the packets. And there is other, other logic which receives those missing package, package, packages uh, if, if those packages were, um, were, saved, were received, then we're saving them. And this happened until, until all the packages will be received. And then we can skip, no, we can jump to the verification procedure. In, in the verification procedure, we're just checking that the CRC32 is, is correct. We're checking if the signature is correct, and then marking that the uh, over-the-air update uh, transfer was successful, and we can uh, reboot to switch the to swap the images. Of course, it may happen that the uh, whole, whole process failed for, for various reasons, um, and in that situation, we're also reporting that back to the to the gateway. Um, our update is um, is uh, phase safe. We can say um, when when the transfer was finished successfully um, and we did all the all the required verification, we re we reboot to MCU boot. We perform swapping the images for the test boot. Uh, of course, uh, before jumping into this test boot uh, cycle, we set watchdog uh, just to make sure if if for example, image will not hang uh, during the boot process. If we boot new image and, and there was no um, watchdog timeout, uh, then we perform application self-test. If the application self-test passes, then we commit new image, like we kind of change the flags and we do another reboot. So MCU boot uh, finish in the, in the production image, we can say, uh, after this step. 
it may happen, of course, that uh, application self-test or, or watchdog timeout for some reason. And then in that situation, we roll back. And the rollback happened that we getting back to MCU boot. MCU boot see that the new image was not committed yet. And then it uh, uh, copies back uh, um, the, the previous image. OK. So this is our, our uh, quote unquote demo. Um, so you can see that on the left side, we, we have serial output from the uh, Zephyr application and, and it reports it's it's in this situation is LPN light. So this is smart lighting application, uh, some some light controller we can say, and and its version is 113. Uh, then we starting uh, yeah so then we starting to on the right side you can you can see that we starting uh, on the gateway side um, uh, OTA OTA update and uh, and you can see here that uh, we have information OTA started waiting for packages and it start to receive packages, receive it binary package with ID zero, receive it uh, binary package with ID one. And this takes a lot of uh, a lot of time from the gateway site, which is maybe not so read readable here. Um, there is um, there is demo CS app manager demo, which perform update using some uh, some some binary, and this uh, this demon show us uh, every packet uh, and it's it's CRC. Yeah. So and then of course we have to wait quite a lot of time, like six seven hours uh, in in uh, in case of our um, our application, and finally we end up with uh, with version like one one five, and I can show some short video uh, related to that. Uh, how how this uh, would how this process start. Uh, let me I hope Is this, this is a five minute video. Uh, I will not start it for five minutes. I let me kind of uh, try Just for time management, I also want to make you aware that you have a couple of questions on the chat. OK, OK. Yeah, so I will look into into questions right now. Um, and you can see how, how this is going on. OK, so can you please specify which LoRaWAN uh, uh, specific version are you using? Because from now, it is unmanaged through and not a picky anymore. Hmm. To be honest, I'm not. Uh, I'm not. Sh I'm not precisely sure. I'm you know more on managing level, uh, so I'm not sure which precise specification it is used. Uh, we using Semtech packet forwarder, so I I believe this have to comply to uh, to most recent standards, um, and and we also using certified LoRa modules, uh, so that 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 means those have to comply to the specification. Uh, No, we don't use uh, firmware uh, over the eight of LoRa LoRa One Alliance. Uh, at least I, I, I we, we this is like our own um, uh, our own design. Uh, what is the size of your? This is this is good question. Uh, to be honest, I I'm not sure right now. Um, I, I believe like this is like couple hundred uh, kilobytes, uh, like two hundred two hundred to fifty. Uh, kilobytes. You mentioned you run your own LoRaWAN stack. Uh, was there something in particular stopping you from using the stack that ships with Zephyr? No, no, we don't use our own uh, LoRaWAN stack. Uh, we uh, we had uh, problems in the past when um, uh, LoRaMark was not yet integrated as a module in the uh, in the Zephyr. Uh, this was. This was some time ago, well, I believe like a year ago or something like that. Uh, but right now we're using um, uh, LoRaWAN uh, Mac, which is integrated with Zephyr. Um, where can find this project for testing gateway and devices? 
so, so like we using open source components that were presented in this uh, in this presentation, we didn't publish uh, uh, all the customization that we had to do for uh, chirp stack, for uh, semtex packet forwarder. Um, since this is like interleaved with uh, application level, um, this is like more like a proprietary solution that we provide to, to our customers. Um, will will you upstream the SX1272 driver? I don't think we uh, we use this driver. This is not 1272, but uh, but the other one. Um, but uh, so I don't think we did any. Uh, I, I see this is Reto. Hello, Reto. Thanks for this question. But um, I don't think think we developed uh, SX1272 driver for this application. Uh, yes, we testing the, this uh, update with multiple devices. Uh, we were able to update up to 20 devices in, in, in the field, and the range of the application is up to three kilometers so far. Uh, what is the current st status of uh, LoRaWAN stack in Zephyr? Hmm. I, I believe this is more question to, to some maintainers, uh, but I can say it is it is usable to the extent that we uh, uh, that, that, that the LoRa Mac can be used effectively without any additional extensive communication. So it works out of the box. Um, yeah. So uh, so Martin replied that SX. SX1272 is already supported. Okay, so that's that would be it from me. Um, so you can see that the update continues. Uh, so the, on the right side, the, the daemon uh, sending packages, and on the left side, you can see that the uh, node receiving those packages. Uh, it, it takes a lot of time, uh, and, and this is not covered in, in this video how it reboots to the to the new image but it shows how how more or less it looks like excellent thank you so much Piotr. um for our next speaker if you have any more questions you can use the chat or follow up on on slack or or email the, the speaker directly please um our next speaker here is camille and miesgo i don't know uh whether you have a presentation uh since we didn't have a chance to test that beforehand Camille? Yeah, we have a presentation here and we will try to show it. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sure. And we can see your presentation. Uh, overlapping your chat window right now. There you go. It does look like you're muted right now. We can uh, hold <laughs> We could see your browser window there for a while, but it went away. Yeah, just a second. There we go. Oh. Okay. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Kamil Panek, and together with Mieszko Mieruński, we will show you our integration of AV systems lightweight M2M library with Zephyr, especially the integration implementation of sensors objects, which uses the Zephyr sensors API. We will start with a general introduction of what the lightweight M2M and so objects are. Then we will describe how Zephyr API may be used to implement these objects using the Android library. And finally, we will show the complete application together with the Coyote IoT device management server. Let's start with some introduction about what the lightweight M2M actually is. Lightweight M2M is a device management protocol which fulfills the, the demands of M2M and IoT environment. Uses the constraint application protocol, also known as COAP, 
as the messaging layer to optimize the amount of data sent between client and server. Due to the usage of co-op, the request response model is used for communication, but in lightweight M2M, both sites as a act as a co-op client and co-op server at the same time. Lightweight M2M specifies four interfaces and much more operations, and depending on which one is used, the device sends requests or handles them. The first interface is Bootstrap, which is used to configure the device by Lightweight M2M Bootstrap server to connect it to the Lightweight M2M server. The second is the client registration interface, which is used to register to the management server and maintain the state of registration. All operations from these two interfaces are handled by the Andre library. So for now, there is no need to describe them more precisely. The remaining two interfaces are device management and service enablement and informa information reporting. And this is what interests us as the users of the library the most, because they are related to the object describing the sensors. The most interesting operations in this case are read and write, which are used which are used by server to read and write data to the device, execute, which allows to trigger some operations on the device, observe and notify, which allows to set up periodic updates and send them to the server. But what, what is actually an object? Object is a collection of logically related resources. Basically everything is in lightweight, M, lightweight M2M is described by objects, including the connection to the server. However, the object itself is just a definition. To be able to operate on resources, there must be at least one instance of an object, which may be cre created by device, bootstrap server, or management server, depending on the use case. Finally, there are previously mentioned resources of various types, such as strings, integers, floats, and so on. They are used to represent the data available in the object instance, or to allow some operations to be made. There are, there are a lot of objects specified in the OMA Lightweight M2M Object and Resource Registry, but right now we, we are interested in one type of them, those specified by the IPSO Alliance. They're, they are mainly related to the measurement of physical values, such as tem temperature, humidity, etc. So they are perfect for implementation of weather stations or environmental sensors, for example. One of the interesting features of them is that they use shared resource identificators for the same type of value. It means that temperature and humidity values, although present in different objects, share the value type and behavior. Of course, one could create a proprietary object and place all resources in it, but using standard objects increases compatibility with servers from various vendors. Let's take a look at parts of the temperature and humidity objects. They, they are identical and differ only by the object ID. The fuel list has 12 resources, but it's required to implement only the mandatory ones. In this case, only the sensor value is mandatory, but it's reasonable to add sensor units, and it could be worth adding a few more, such as mean measured value, max measured value, and reset mean and max measured values. They allow some basic processing of data on the device site and potentially decrease the amount of data sent by device, depending on the specific use case. Note that, note that the last resource has a different type uh, of operation defined. It means that it's an executable resource and thus it doesn't hold any value but allows to perform the described operation. Since we have a summary of what ITSO objects offer, we'll look, look at, at what Zephyr gives us to implement those objects. So Zephyr provides a universal API for various types of sensors, which hides the implementation details from the users. It means that no matter what value we want to read from any of the sensors, We'll always use three functions. Device get binding to retrieve the device structure during initialization of object. Sensor sample fetch chan to fetch a sample from the sensors and store it internally. Sensor sample get to get the previously read value. To take advantage of this universal API and decrease the amount of code, we'll create a single generic lightweight M2M object, which then could be used to represent various sensors in the data model. A UML diagram representing the approach is shown on this slide. In basic sensors object E, we have object and sensor related fields, which are set during initialization and not changed afterwards. They are object ID, a device structure, a sensor channel and unit related to the sensor value. The other three fields are periodically updated to always provide a complete state for immediate use. 
Operations on the on the object in this case are performed by calling for handlers by the Android library. They are list instances to list all available instances, which equals always to one in this case, because we have uh, one sensors of, of given type. These resources, which list available resources, uh, those resources were mentioned two slides before. Resource execute to handle execute operations on executable resource and resource read to handle read operations on readable resources. Examples of instances of this object are shown on the right and they con contain all the specific all the specific uh, parts of each object. As can be seen, adding a new object with this approach requires defining only four values. Now my colleague Mieszko will show you how this approach is implemented in our demo application by getting a development board from ST. Thank you. My name is Mieszko Mirinski. Uh, I will show an example that will be an implementation of environment sensor device using ST's discovery kit for IoT node. Uh, it contains various environment sensors as well as connectivity via Wi-Fi using ES Wi-Fi modem. For this task, Zephyr provides RTOS, networking API, and sensor drivers, and Android library provides the entire lightweight M2M stack, including the co-op library. First things first, we need to integrate Android with Zephyr. Thankfully, it is available as a Zephyr module, so all we need to do is create an application repository with REST manifest in it and point it to proper repositories. Here we are showing existing Android Zephyr client repo, which contains all the code used in examples. And moving on to implementing sensor objects. There are several things which must be included in object definition. Uh, LWM interface handlers are functions called by library when server requests specified operation, such as resource with or list resources, uh, and Zephyr device that is going to be used for sensor handling, and sensor current, minimal, and maximal values. During object creation, we need to get sensor device binding to allow creating different sensor objects with the same code base. As function parameters, we get device name, sensor channel, measurement unit, and object ID. If obtaining value from sensor is successful, we allocate new L lightweight M2M object, fill it with initial values and parameters, and return it to allow registering with a, within lightweight M2M client. Object update function fetches data from sensors and puts the values into proper resources. Value is received using Zephyr sensor API, then it is written into a current sensor value, and the notify changed function checks if server is currently observing given resource and if observation criteria are met, notification is scheduled to be sent. This function imp is implemented uh, so that we don't have to pull sensor values on the each read of the object. We only do that periodically, for example, in uh, one second periods. And we can also notify this way. Uh, and it is also used by notifications to notify the server that the value has changed. Moving on to implementation of interface handlers, we will start with list resources handler. It is a simple function that is called during discovery process. It informs server what resources are available in the object and read requests. <coughs> and in need with request to check if resource exists and requested operation it can be executed. In the example, we will see typical sensor resource IDs, their type, and if they are present. Here we have four readable resources, minimal, maximal, and current sensor values as well as sensor units. There is also single executable resource, which resets minimal and maximal measured values. With resource read function, value of resource is specified by resource ID returned to the server. Format is compliant with what is specified in the IPSO registries. That way server knows what type of value should it expect. This, fu this function is called when read is issued from server, as well as when client notifies server of resource change. Resource execute is called in case uh, execute operation was requested by the server. In the sensor object, we have single executable resource. We set minimal and maximal measured values, and basically that is what this function does. Finally, in the client application, we can create and register our sensor objects. First, we initialize an NJ client. After that, we can use our previously defined create functions and register the results using NJ register object. What is left is to install storage and other necessary objects. With that, we will have a minimal client application containing our sensors, which full example of full, full code example can be found on GitHub at NJ Zephyr client repository. 
After all necessary functions and handlers are implemented, we can write down functions for creating specific sensor instances. In this case, we are creating barometer, distance, temperature, and humidity sensor objects. As you can see on the listing, we are using the same basic sensor object to create function in every case. After connecting to the lightweight machine-to-machine -machine server, for example, Coyote device management server, we can see our sensor objects and their values displayed. Thanks to the object and the resource registry, hundreds of different objects are standardized and the server can determine how to display and store their data based purely on object and resource identifiers provided by lightweight M2M client. And comparing them with the registry XML files, thus saving bandwidth and implementation time needed for various sensors. Objects provide more functionality than simply reading sensor values. Data monitoring and observation can be set up for the whole device or individually for single objects or resource. Other than reading value periodically, we can set up observations to notify if sensor value is outside of specified range or it's changed by some amount. There is a lot of customization that can be done, making device management simple and useful. In the device management platform, we can explore collected data. Starting with simple plots and followed by various statistics such as mean and mean value or data frequency. We can also export our data to a CS file for external processing, stream it to Azure or AWS Cloud, or we can trigger other integrations. So now we will move to the live demo of how does the Android Zephy client works. That was specified here. First, we will start with the Zephy project. I will increase the... Oh. Okay, so here I already have my Android Zephy client repository cloned. So I will just go into it. And into the projects and STM example. Here I can just do West build. Now it is building the example that we were talking about. So what is left to do is to flash our application. And as it can take some time, we will switch to the Coyote device management platform to prepare it for uh, registering our demo. First things first, we need to log in. We will see the current list of the devices present. We see, so now if we go into device inventory, we can add a new device. We select connect to LVM them device directly via the management server. And here we provide some uh, user-friendly endpoint name. It can be also generated randomly if we expect to connect hundreds of devices. For security, we select PSK and provide some test key for now. From creation of our device, and here we can see that our device has been entered into the management server, and now we are waiting for the connection. The most important parts are the URL, endpoint name, and key. So the device has been flashed. I will now connect to the serial port to the device. So I'm resetting the board to show that it is starting. We have some initial configuration here, so it will uh, currently register with the default configuration. We can uh, we are using Zephyr shell now, so everything is configurable in the runtime, but we can also use the conf files. So this is the current configuration. We will need to change the endpoint name.
uh, we can change while it's running, so we have to stop the client. Okay, the client has stopped, and now we set our endpoint name. We make sure that the configuration matches with what we had. We have the same server UE, <coughs> endpoint name, and PSK. Now we can just do unrestart. Okay, we can see that registered, uh, registered objects, uh, also that the registration has been successful. Now if we go back to the Coyote device management, we see that uh, we can now go to devices it has connected to the server. And we see that our device is connected here when it was registered and what is the lifetime of the object. If we go to the objects, we can see all of the objects present on the device and the objects that were defined by us. That is temperature, humidity, barometer. And there are also different objects like axillium barometer that are contained in the example on the GitHub. Now we can just read the values that is currently, it's quite hot now, so it's 32 degrees. We can also define some value tracking for that. We can do observe or we can do monitoring. And we can select what time, how many notifications should be sent. If we set that tracking, we will see that the values change over time. Okay, so that will conclude the live demo. So in the summary, uh, IPSA objects allow us to create uh, lightweight machine-to-machine -machine based devices compatible with servers from various vendors. And uh, thanks to Zephyr, we have a universal API for all types of sensors which simplify implementation of IPSA objects. Uh, the presented approach allows to save both space in the, on the flash memory and uh, time required to add new objects. If this example was interesting to you, check out whole source code with bigger explanations in the NJ Zephyr client samples. Uh, for NJ integration into existing Zephyr application, there is NJ Zephyr module available on GitHub used by the samples. And for more information on Coyote device management platform, there are several resources available in following links, as well as openly available demo. So thank you for watching, and currently we welcome any questions, and I will read the chat now. If anybody has a question they want to ask in person, <laughs> raise your hand. No, no, no. We'll also make some room at the end of the presentation or end of the session for um, questions to any other speakers. So if you hang around until that, it would be great. Uh, OK, so I think there is a question about update. Uh, so update messages are handled uh, automatically by the by the Android library. So there is no no need to care about about them if you are using the the Android library. There is there is a loop which which handles the, the update messages automatically, as well as as reads from uh, as requests from the from the server. Oh yes, so so Android supports a. Uh, Android has a, an API to, to implement firmware update. Uh, so in our case, the, the, li the library contains the object five used for firmware update, but the user needs to implement uh, the, their own handlers, yeah, for for flashing the the firmware or for re rebooting the device. But uh, yeah, the library is open source and is available on GitHub. Uh, supporting the lightweight M2M 1.0 version. Thank you.
All right, thank you very much. And as I mentioned, we'll leave some room at the end if there are questions for any of the of the speakers as well. So with that, uh, let's switch here, uh, Gregory. You are still muted, um, so we can't hear you, but we, see, we can see your screen. Ah. Thank you. My name is Gregory Shu. I'm from uh, Lagrand, and uh, I've been attempting to use Zephyr to set up a new code base uh, based on a, a designed around a software product line architecture. I've got experience from that from another company, um, and so I wanted to give a field report of what I've seen uh, that works well from Zephyr and what doesn't. Uh, let me. Uh, I've tried to abbreviate this so that we had time for discussion at the end of this for some proposals and some shortcomings. Let's uh, let's go ahead and get going on this. In the late 90s, Hewlett Packard management made a strategic de decision to restructure the desktop in inkjet printer development to reduce expenses and improve efficiency. The decision was to change the development paradigm from leverage and potential reuse to reuse and extend. My printer project was severely impacted by this and was required to deliver a hybrid implementation of functionality from old and new firmware architectures. We uh, internally jokingly called this the platypus architecture because the implementation was rather, uh, how should we say, ugly? It was solid, but it was very awkward to maintain. That business decision and paradigm shift were the beginnings of Hewlett Packard's Owen Printer Firmware Cooperative, a Hall of Fame example of what the Software Engineering Institute calls a software product line development paradigm. It was and is wildly more successful than anyone involved expected. With the onset of IoT security regulations and my many years of experience previously working in that SPL, my attempt to set up a new SPL built upon the Zephyr ecosystem proved largely promising, but the Zephyr project still needs a paradigm shift to reach where it seems to be headed. The plan for this particular talk is, I'm gonna give an introduction to software product lines, about six minutes. Uh, I'm uh, gonna go over what are the core assets that uh, how Zephyr supports that, and then uh, for about six minutes, and then my uh, proposals for some uh, some uh, things to enact in Zephyr in order to achieve a high level of software product line support in Zephyr, looking at version 2.6.0. Then I'm gonna try to leave about 12 minutes to the end for the discussion of the proposals, as I was expecting this to be a, a more of a working session than uh, a straight presentation. Um, by the way, about half of my slides have been moved to the end of the slide deck uh, into backup slides in order to leave time for discussion of proposal. If we, uh, we have time, I will get to those and show you more of the details uh, behind this presentation. First, what is a software product line? And uh, many of these slides, I have uh, copied the content from, I hate it when it goes ahead of me, from, uh, a presentation in 2008 uh, done by the Software Engineering Institute located at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, I'm assuming you will be able to read these slides faster than I can explain them, so I'm just going to hit some highlights on these things. The definition is actually really important. A software product line in this context is a set of software intensive systems sharing a common managed set of features that satisfy the specific needs of a particular market segment or mission and that are developed from a common set of core assets in a prescribed way. Each of those underlined uh, phrases is centrally important to the scope and purpose of a software product line. One of the key things out of this is it's a new application of a proven concept. And this was back in the 2000s. Uh, it is not even a new application of it anymore. Uh, it's an innovative growing concept in software engineering. It's actually uh, fairly widely used at this point. 
Software product lines involve strategic planned reuse, and that's a key word there, reuse, that yields predictable results. When I first was presented with software product lines, I got to see this slide in, and uh, it took me a while to digest each of these things that a software product line is not, because they're things that I was used to. And it's important to understand a software product line is more broad than just the items that are listed there. It's not clone and own, it's not small grained reuse, it's not just component based, it's not versions of a single product, it's not just a configurable architecture, it's not just technical standards. There's uh, a software product line itself includes not just the code base, but it also includes governance policies on there, it includes management and business support. So I'm not looking to at Zephyr as a software product line architecture solution, but I'm looking for it to be a support and enabler for it. Um, we can come back to these as people uh, have any questions. Where has a software product line been used? Even back in 2008, it's been used in a wide range of applications. I don't know what's up with my computer, I'm sorry. Um, and my, and my wireless mouse is uh, turned off. So it's been used in mobile phones, in pagers, in avionics systems, in engine control systems, in medical devices, financial and tech systems. It's been used in some military systems for uh, ship types of things, large to small, uh, battery powered embedded to, uh, to military ships. It is not just a narrowly scoped concept. Um, innovators and early adopters demonstrated the feasibility and benefits of software product lines. Notably on there for me, and actually for you, is Hewlett Packard, where I got my particular experience. Um, in the mid 2000s, HP presenter to the software product line conference shared with me that HP's software product lines seem to be far more successful and mature than the others presented at the recent conferences. Reason for sharing that is um, I'm bringing what may be uncommon experience in this particular area to this analysis. It's um, speaking of, of the experience, HP's own firmware cooperative, and it's got links there for you to be able to follow for it. For connected devices targeted to run 24 seven for greater than seven years without a power cycle. Fax machines. First, I was around for the first seven generations and they were all designed around an one RTOS running on a 32 bit ARM9 on HP SOCs. Um, very relevant to what we're doing with Zephyr. It evolved into a continuously integrated worldwide Git repository. We had all products out of this being developed out of one branch, uh, one main integration branch. Um, the product line included not just IoT printers, scanners, faxes, but it also included the camera dock. And uh, that led to some uh, surprising discoveries of, oh, I don't have to have a print engine. It was far more successful than the originators imagined. So I'm now working at Legrand and we're looking to, um, for efficiencies and the whole security stuff, set up a software product line. I hate it when this thing goes ahead of me. Um, our strategy is to follow the Zephyr, use the Zephyr ecosystem, following Zephyr's T2 star topology with an application repository, the hub, all repositories tied in through the module mechanism. Currently we have, um, we're using a partition of repositories based on ownership and licensing, which means we're using 50 modules from the Zephyr project itself, six open source that we've had to, had to extend to be modules, and we've got one proprietary manifest plus module that we're using for our, our value added code. All functionality we're designing to be in composable, configurable subsystems, drivers, and data sets. And uh, we're putting all of the documentation, all the workspace level documentation in our manifest repository. The idea is we're not touching the Zephyr repository clone. Um, and we are expecting to be able to reuse the uh, build system and requirements tracing generation and all the rest of those tools out of Zephyr. 
What does that topology look like? Well, Zephyr claims, at least with West, to support three different topologies. Um, you can see them here. The star topology where Zephyr is the manifest repository, star topology where a Zephyr application is the manifest repository, and that's the one that we're using. And then the third is a forest where the manifest is outside of any other repositories. What's important to note here is inside of a repository, you can have any mix of content inside of there between the various contents that are up on the top, documentations, manifests, uh, applications, test libraries, subsystems, drivers, boards, and uh, that's actually really important to being able to make these composable. What is the cost of a software product line? Um, again, from their particular slide. There is uh, an architecture that's considered a, a core asset, and we must support, support variation intended in the problem, inherent in the product line. There are software components that must be designed in, to be general without a loss of performance and must be built in support of variation points. Test plans, test cases, test data must consider variation points and multiple instances of the product line. Business case and market analysis, that one's not quite so relevant, but it's important to a software product line. Project plans um, must be generic and be made extensible to accommodate product variation. Tools and processes must be more robust than required for single product development, which is the, uh, the uh, context that the original slide was talking to. People, skills, and training must involve training and expertise centered around the assets and procedures associated with the product line. So all of these, this table came directly from that uh, reference presentation. The slides that I have in the backups evaluate each of these core assets and evaluate Zephyr against each of these core assets and identify where it's supporting, where Zephyr's supporting it, and where there's opportunity for full support uh, of software product line. I will share those if we have time to get to them. If we don't, feel free to, to pull up the slide deck and go look at uh, what those comparisons are. Okay, what is needed in Zephyr for high level support of a software product line? I boiled all the shortcomings down to essentially three, three decisions that need to be made. And they're all in areas where there's potentially open issues and open questions currently in the Zephyr project. First one is around, what do we do with the existing extensibility? The module.yaml files and, the extent, and all that kind of stuff. What we need for software product line support really is to embrace that extensibility because it's the reuse and extend paradigm that was extremely powerful for uh, the HP software product line and it's central to software product line type of stuff. Is, what does that mean? Potentially maintain full functionality across module extensibility perpetually evaluate how each aspect of the ecosystem is impacted by module extensibility. Second area is around reuse. Zephyr seems to be reusing other open source repositories, extending them to being modules, hosting them on Zephyr Project Arcos. Um, but there's some shortcomings in Zephyr itself uh, implementation that make it at times uh, less than ideal for itself to be reused. And uh, there are some patterns in implementations of things and organization of content that uh, should get tweaked in order to actually support Zephyr being treated as a module of the Zephyr build system and having its content referenced outside. Um, and it needs to perpetually consider topologies where Zephyr is not the manifest repository. Third area 
where changes in perspective would be helpful is around composability. How do we, do we really have things set up to be able to select, I want this subsystem and I want that implementation of the subsystem um, and have it done cleanly? There's some tweaking that needs to be done inside of that. Uh, basic decision is, goal is to perpetually consider a project is simply a collection of functionalities supported by a configuration of subsystems, libraries, and drivers. It's a simple definition, tweaks some of the way that we organize things, but mostly it's a change in perspective. Um, let's go a little bit farther on those. So proposals on here. Secure firmware imposes requirements. I'm sorry. Secure firmware imposes requirements on the entire executable. So all code built into the image is affected. First proposal, let's at least add a definition into the glossary of code base, because we've referred to code base um, in existing documentation. And let's define the code base in the glossary to be all source for the Zephyr config build CI doc generation system, not as opposed to being all the stuff inside of a repository. One of the things that uh, you saw I had to do, we've seen Zephyrs had to do, is to extend existing open source repositories. And we're going to have to do this with private repositories also to also be usable with Zephyr. Um, which means that there's code in, the, in that repository that's not seen by Zephyr and shouldn't be imposed on it. That change, that clarification, will help with the mental perspective of what portion is Zephyr and what portion is not. Second proposal, where secure firmware artifacts are needed, the artifacts also need to cover the entire code base, as in all the modules. Right now, there's an, there's an open question, and I'm not even sure it's an, it's an outstanding question, of what is what do we do with all of the modules that are out there? How do they interact with things? We've done a lot of focusing on how do we get the stuff inside of Zephyr itself uh, in proper shape and, and stitched together. It's now time to look at this extensibility. What do we do with the modules? My proposal, all tools for firmware configuration, build, debugging, testing, and document generation, all those things that were in that diagram need to recognize and operate on the entire code base found through Zephyr extra modules and Zephyr modules. Those are the, uh, the CMake variables to say, here's all the stuff that you're working on. And it needs to follow all settings in an explicit or implicit module.yaml. We, over the last year, Zephyr has evolved uh, module.yaml to be more formal uh, extension description file for uh, the build integration and test systems. It's, um, it's not consistently being used. So this proposal is really elevate the importance of using the mechanisms that are already there. Uh, One question? Yeah, one question. Uh, have you sure. started playing, have you started playing around with the uh, new features for generating a software bill of materials that got added in two in two six? I have not. Okay. Um, but the plan is that uh, well, what I've been implementing is in all of all of our repositories, we're uh -huh. instrumenting it with we're instrumenting it with SPDX licenses, and the expectation is the mechanism that's there for. Uh, software bill of materials, we're going to inherit and reuse. Okay. We, 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 we want to be a pure extension of Zephyr and do that through modules. So that we have already picked up Twister, we picked code coverage, we picked up, uh, I, I've had to manually uh, parallel documentation on there, but it's all set up so that it, it, when these things get resolved, we are, we're reusing those mechanisms. So the plan is 
what you get with software build, what you provide with software build of materials, that is our solution. Okay. No, I'm just, you know, it makes sense. <laughs> I just was trying to figure out if this has been played with or not. Yeah. So, no, so I, 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 like I said, the manifest file is, you know, specific to Zephyr. And so if you were trying to extend beyond and interact with systems outside. Oh, no, no, no. We're, we're, we're using the import mechanism and we're following the, the uh, setup of the manifest file. Reuse. And it's really a, a huge change in thinking mm -hmm. as opposed to behavior. And it's really empowering when everybody along the path is committed to reuse. Any other questions? Keep going, I guess. <laughs> it just seems I'll, I'll have a few more, but I'll let you keep going. Sure. Now, there, there's only four more proposals. We're going to go through them quickly. And then we'll come around and, like I said, I've been trying to leave room for dialogue. And this is exactly the kind of dialogue I'm looking to leave room for. Uh, okay. Third proposal. We know that uh, MISRA Directive 3.1, which is required, states that all code should be traceable to documented requirements. So generated requirement traceability artifacts will need to be included for the entire code base, which means that Zephyr is going to have to do it for their HALs. Um, and supporting the T2 topology implies that the Zephyr documentation tools can generate documentation, including requirements traceability, from the entire code base. So the proposal is that Zephyr documentation is to be adjusted to include documentation found in the entire code base. How documentation is reorganized really needs to be managed by the document uh, document system maintainers and collaborators. I'm just saying we, we really need to set that up for there and embrace the extensibility. If SAR is embracing live reuse of Zephyr, live reuse includes topologies where the, un, where the unmodified Zephyr repository is just another module in the workspace. Proposal. The Zephyr documentation generation tools support workspace level content coming from the manifest repository. When I integrate Zephyr into my product, I'm not making Zephyr code, I'm making code for my product. When I do it for a software product line, I, I need top level it to be for the entire solution space. And that's really where the workspace level con documentation needs to describe. What needs to be done at the workspace? Well, we know explicitly Names, themes, logos, shortcuts, introduction. What are some things that need to get generated at the workspace level? What's the module list? Aggregate gloss glossary, boards, samples. What it needs to be at the module? Well, there may be, it may be appropriate to have a module name and logo and introduction and guides and release notes. There's work to do in here, but the concept of workspace level documentation being containing Zephyr information is probably the most important thing out of that and being able to set up the documentation system to support that. Fifth proposal, Zephyr CI verify support of all user configurable settings in module.yaml. It currently doesn't. And this is something as we're looking for Zephyr to get reused, that probably be reused for product integration, that the Zephyr project should probably own so that uh, we're making sure that functionality continues to be there. Not a huge change, but it's an important one. Um, embracing composability. Composability means being able to configure boards, drivers, and subsystems together in a working device without requiring crafting or tuning. And there's a lot behind that. Fossil is actually pretty, pretty simple. Specify a location in the Zephyr directory tree structure 
for the configure file overlays. And using the existing pattern of the overlay files um, on, on project.com uh, or with project.com to build up functionality. Provide documentation and example to show how they are referenced in the project's cmakelist.txt. So those are proposals for actionable things, some of which are small, some of which are not so small, uh, that would really lead us to embracing those three aspects of Zephyr that we're currently faced with, that are currently have some functionality existing in. And they would really enable the reuse, which enables software product line support. Okay, that took longer than I thought, so I'm not gonna get to the backup slides. Uh, let's go over to the chat. Yeah, we, we've, we've had um, Marty and Anas join us. So if you could just cool. go back to the proposals. So um, cause I think they're more probably gonna be most relevant for some discussion here. Okay, um, uh, so now I, I have not been looking at the chat. Are there any questions we need to there's, answer there's first? There's no specific questions in the chat. And so I think if people just wanna unmute, unmute themselves and start talking, that's probably gonna be the most effective where things are not clear. Um, as opposed to you know putting things in the chat. I think there's some subtleties here that a discussion and that's what we want these mini comps to be effectively is discussion. So thank you for you know sort of starting that off. Oops, we do have a question in the chat. Um, have you uh, have you modeled today for this proposal from Omar? Omar, feel free to just unmute and start talk asking too. Uh, so you mean have I have I attempted to do these things? Yes, been doing them for the last year in Zephyr. Uh, as a matter of fact, the um, application manifest repository, manifest module repository, we mm -hmm. uh, concept, we now have in Zephyr project, a new repository as of last December uh, called example application, where uh, it uses Zephyr and is being populated now with uh, further content in each of those areas, drivers and subsystems and libraries and boards and, and projects um, to help bootstrap people and more important to me, to help verify that the Zephyr build system does these things. In uh, what I shared earlier about my own plan or in plan inside of Lagrange, and I was the one individually doing this, uh, with the six repositories that needed to get Zephyrized and the one proprietary one. Yeah, I've got that working. Um, it's, I, I understand a lot about the concepts. Uh, can't share all of that with you, but, uh, but the example application repository is uh, readily available and runnable at this point. Because SPO needed in big company, can it be compatible with V model? Sure, absolutely. There is nothing inside of the SPO that, that limits or dictates the particular development model. This is more about how is code organized rather than how is code justified um, and what the development process is. And inside of Legrand, we're looking to use a V model. Uh, does it need a big company? No, not at all. Most of what uh, is needed infrastructure-wise to help support a lot of these things seems to be largely in place with the Zephyr project. This is one of the things about the Zephyr project that excites me. It's like, oh, all of this infrastructure types of things, test cases, documentation, and then in. You know, and automated running tools, they're providing. They've almost figured out the solution that we had 20 years ago in HP. Um, the, uh, I would say on an overall scale, Zephyr's probably about two thirds of where I'd like to see it to be. Uh, 
really would be empowered with about an 80% solution. Uh, I think the sulfur certification application as SIL or safety, yes. I think where its power really isn't in the certification itself, it's in how do we manage not just high volume, low mix types of business domains, but how do we manage low volume, high mix types of domains, especially when we have to continuously update them with security fixes. It's how do we maintain them over the long haul? How do we continue to verify them? And how do we reduce our bugs? Absolutely. Um, now, uh, since uh, we've got a couple that have joined us, Anas is on here. Uh, Anas, I'm assuming you've had a chance to look at these two proposals and who, Kate, who else joined us beside Anas? Marty's joined us as well. Cool. Okay, so um, Marty and Anas, let's let's talk about the first two proposals that are on the slide, uh, and I'd love to hear your feedback on them. Hey, Greg. I mean, I, I just joined a few minutes earlier, and um, I mean, I'm just saying proposal there. I really need. And probably others more, more uh, just joined. We need we need more context. I'm not sure exactly yeah, what I, context. I, of, I, yeah. So so I mean the the, the, the I, right. I mean I I can look at that, and the right way to do it is actually to submit that as a proposal. If you didn't already like using GitHub or discussion and so on with more context, so we can discuss that. I don't think I mean yeah. your talk here should be used to discuss proposals. Yeah. But I mean, I can you can go through that, and we can we can follow on uh, after that and talk about the proposal specifically. Yeah. Okay. So I I, I was uh, led to believe that we wanted to have some working sessions here, and so it was actually the second yeah. proposal that I thought would involve the most discussion on here. And that's um, that's fine, but as I said, I am completely missing the context here. It's yeah. talking here about device management, and I'm just, you know, yeah. I, I don't, I mean, there has been probably background there. How did you get there and so on? So we can talk specifically there, but I mean, it's, I, I it's think, not. I think, yeah, I think that the, the, the challenge, thanks, Nas. I think the challenge here is to be able to evolve a system so we can do device management at scale with a certain amount of, um, Infrastructure and discipline in places. I think Greg's point. Uh, Gregory, uh, feel free to contra contradict me if I'm getting it wrong here. And so um, there's some of the best practices out from the software engineering that can be looked at being applied here. Yeah. Uh, and we're close. Oh, yes. Um, and so it's just a question of where the gaps are and then what the benefit of the of um, closing those gaps are is, I guess, you know, part of what and us and so forth. I think actually, if you go on to, um, you know, um, what we're talking about here with this type of thing is, you know, the scope of the whole project. These two are both, you know, defining what the scope of Zephyr is um, for extra modules and uh, explicit and implicit. Um, it's something I don't know if there's a good place to discuss uh, in the TSC meetings or things like that or in pull requests. So the idea was to have a bit of a discussion here, just to right. uh, see if we could feel our way around the problem for an approach. As a proposal, I think this comes falls a little bit short because it's it's really hard to reason around it unless it's presented as problem, alternatives, proposed solution, right? And this this is just a pitch of a solution without necessarily describing the problems that the current offering brings. So, and um, as mentioned, I think this is actually a little bit off topic for the device management, or at least it's it's so far removed from the device management um, benefits of these kind of constructs that uh, it's a little bit hard to have a discussion maybe with the current um, list of attendees here because they're probably more focused on the more practical device management um, aspects. So it probably makes sense to do a follow up discussion on this in a, in a separate forum. Yeah, yeah, I okay. completely agree. I mean, there, there is it's it, the the problem described here. At least I'm trying to extract the problem uh, on the slide. It it 
has a lot of a lot of sides and a lot of implications, and there are different ways to this can be done. Yeah, uh, it's 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 definitely something that needs uh, follow up discussion. All of this that you are showing there with topologies and and the tools that we provide does not mean that we actually have to provide the complete solution for everybody to use and. Because every, I mean, this is the fact of life. I mean, you give West and you give the build system and you give all of the nice tools that we do, and we still have a lot of even members of the project. They use their own tools. Yeah, they use their own infrastructure. They use your own, uh, own CI, etc. There is no way we can force or or write like a solution either this way or it will not work. It's I mean, it's it's very it's very wide, and uh, it's it, the discussion needs to probably start from somewhere where we all agree this is a problem, and I I'm, I'm not sure we are there yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you want to maybe um, bring in the uh, the things about the Misra that you were just looking at, since we do have an us on here let's now? Take, let's take that on security. That it, it's okay, off topic okay. here. Let's just not take that here. Or safety, sorry. Yeah. But it's not a safety specific thing. There is no requirement to have MESRA compliance on Zephyr as a project. That's only the safety group that cares about that. Oh, yeah. Which is the Zephyr project. Yeah. I mean, that's. Uh, 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 yeah, I, 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 I agree. This is not the topic for this discussion. We can take that. And actually, we talked about it uh, uh, previously. Yeah. So. Yeah. But that's, I, I, I don't know, yeah, it's a little bit off, for me, it's a little bit off topic and like short term and like short notice to be talking about these things at this level. Yeah. So again, it, we need to step back and understand what the problem we are trying to solve here and, uh, and, and, and look at this, whether it's like how we manage modules using West, how do you do documentation, how do you do requirements, MISRA compliance, coding guidelines, and so on. This is, these are, each of them is like a topic on its own. Yeah, I mean, that <laughs> can take weeks, months, or sometimes so, so more than that. Where, yeah. So where in the Zephyr, Zephyr project community do you think is the right place to have these discussions? I think there. I think these discussions are. They have multiple homes and in multiple sub uh, subgroups of the project, which is what what's making fitting this as a as an umbrella discussion in hard in any specific forum. Um, documentation is handled separately. Build environment modules and all that uh, is handled. You know, we have a separate minicom for that. Uh, safety has its own minicom. So. Um, yeah. To be honest, it might make more sense to to shop these ideas around in those forums because there you're going to have the right set of people that care about that that yeah. portion of the project. Safety, the safety stuff though is it's more than just safety, and so that's I think the point that Greg's making here is it's um, you know this is sort of orientation like this may actually be like level TSC stuff. I'm not sure when us wants it. Is this sort of yeah, like? Yeah. We maybe don't need to bring it up here that much, but I think I think my uh, opinion on, on safety is known by now that we need to not let it slow down the rest of the project, which it's doing a little bit. Uh, but yeah. So who's going to carry this forward? The way these kind of projects tend to work is that the person who are passionate about it carry the, the, the topic, right? Right. So um, unless you have some sort of you know corporate packing where, where it's important for the company and then they have somebody engaged in the project. Um, so if you're passionate about this and want to carry it forward, I suggest that you go out and seek these connections um, across across the project. Well, I think that um, so I know that um, the other person I know who cares about these things is um, Pete Brink. And um, so I'm almost wondering, do we need to start looking at forming something like a software engineering discussion group or some sort of way where the people who care about the 
cleaning up the software engineering side of it and connecting up the requirements and so forth so that we have traceability and testing and the yes. infrastructure to support it have a place Kate, to I, I, I still I still think I mean before we start with groups let's let's first let's step back again uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm I'm trying yes. to look at the big picture here yeah. and try what problems we are trying to solve and sorry, I mean, I was in another session. I joined that and all of a sudden we are talking about safety. We are talking about infrastructure. We are talking about documentation. So this is really confusing to me. Yeah, these topics are as just as as all of said, they are being handled in different places. And uh, I, I think the best way to carry this forward is as you have it on the on the on the slide discussion. So I had put up this question to a couple of students uh, uh, from what different. What is that? Is that the meeting next room or next door? Yeah, <laughs> 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 that that okay. could be weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's <laughs> weird. In a virtual room. <laughs> okay. So I mean, just like you have a discussion, Greg. What I would suggest is to uh, uh, put that in form of of a discussion with with the background and the points, and and try to 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 create mold. I mean try to find where these topics fit and bring these topics into the right forums and that we can help you with that yeah but right now again i i feel like a, a chicken without a head yeah because it's <laughs> it, it, no seriously it's it's, uh, oh, it's I like really confusing I, I, I there's too many too many high level things and I, I, it's it you you have been involved with the project for a while so and there are different forums to bring this up start with the discussion and we can then take it from there and yeah. identify areas of interest and 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 drive this through the to through the different forums whether it's security safety ci documentation you name it yeah Actually, i'm wondering yeah i'm almost wondering if the process form is a good spot no no I, I, no I don't think so. yeah i don't think so i think the first thing is to put that in a discussion somewhere and then we can take it from there the process is not about this. We are not. We are not uh, trying to change a process, or because we don't know what what is the proposal. We don't. <laughs> so let's let's open a discussion, and an open ended discussion. Yeah, an RFC. We we created that, and and put all of these ideas of yours, and and we can then take it from there into the right forums. Thank that you, would Marcus. be my suggestion. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, that, that makes sense. Um, uh, and it's it's good to hear that there's now um, direction and awareness uh, that these uh, that this will be coming so that it can get traction going forward. Uh, because the, uh, the the context that you missed, Annis, is there's there's a number of aspects that exist in Zephyr that haven't had clarification around them and decisions made around them like extensibility and uh, so that's that particular one happens to affect all these areas okay glad to hear glad to hear we've got uh, we we got advice for how to carry this forward yeah let's do that i mean again these are too many topics some of them might you know, apply some of them right, you know, from the start, we can say, no, this is not where the project is going. Let's let's put that aside yeah? and we can agree to put these things aside. Yeah, and and things that are, you know, are really relevant to the project. And this is not my would not be my opinion or somebody else's opinion. This is I mean, if we have a, a, the right proposal and we start the discussion, we can take that to the right forums and and see if there is an agreement there. Yeah, it is. It is not going to be uh, uh, one person or you know saying no. I don't like this idea. It's going to be hopefully a project level, just like we are doing with many other proposals that we have uh, in the queue. Yeah. So yeah, let's let's take that uh, uh, into a different for in in the different forums through the a discussion or or an RFC, and we will guide you through that. Thank you. Um, now, were there any other questions that anyone else had um, regarding what I presented?
Um, are the slides posted now? Yes. Awesome. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, thank you, Gregory. And uh, I, I think there's also an appropriate time to open up the floor for any other questions uh, to any of the other speakers. I see most of them are still on uh, in the session here um, in case something didn't get answered, something came up um, after the individual presentations. Okay, I'm not uh, I'm not hearing anything or saying anything right now. Um, so with that we can wrap up this session uh, a few minutes early. Thank you everybody for participating and I hope to see you at uh, the next one, uh, whatever that topic might be. Thanks everybody. I'm uh, turning off the recording now as well.